Hi, welcome to Hope Online. It's great to have you with us, especially if you're here uh, for the first time. If you're part of the church, it's wonderful to be worshiping God together. We've got a great online meeting for you today. Phoebe Gubb's gonna be leading us in worship, and later, Guy and Heather Miller are gonna be speaking uh, on the subject of, does God heal today? At the end of the meeting, we have a Zoom cafe. We've also got a Zoom prayer room, and our team will be ready to pray with you should you respond at the end of uh, the meeting this morning. I was reading from Romans chapter 11 this week. Let me read it to you as we come into our time of worship. Oh, what a wonderful God we have. How great are his riches and wisdom and knowledge. How impossible it is for us to understand his decisions and his methods. For who can know what the Lord is thinking? Who knows enough to be his counselor? And who could ever give him so much that he would have to pay it back? For everything comes from him. Everything exists by his power and is intended for his glory. To him be glory evermore. Amen. Thanks for joining us today. Let's worship God together. One, two, three.
praise you, Jesus. We give you glory. You are King Jesus. And we take off our heaviness. We put a garment of praise on. We're the ones that celebrate the Lord. Let's continue to worship Him. We're talking about healing this morning. So as we go into this next song, be expectant. The Bible says you need a mustard, side of a mustard seed of faith. So be expectant that God can move in your life, where you are right now, in your living room, on a bus, on a train, wherever you're listening from. It's so good to have you. God is moving. God moves now. He is alive. The Word of God is as sharp as a double-edged sword. He is here, in my house and in your house. some healing to some people listening to our online service this morning. If you have a problem with your intestine or you might have a problem with a twisted colon, I felt that God would want to heal you in that area of your body. I'm going to pray in a minute so if you want to place your hand on the area of the body that's affected. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you that you love us with an everlasting love. Thank you that you are our healer and that you hear us when we pray. I pray for the healing name of Jesus to come upon the intestine or twisted colon. I pray for your healing power to be felt by anybody seeking healing this morning. Be healed in the name of Jesus. Amen. 
So um, I saw a picture of a bowl, the shape of a cereal bowl, um, and uh, this person was pouring things into this bowl, pouring things to make their life feel good uh, and enjoyable and fun. But the bowl had a hole at the bottom, and all these good things were falling out the bottom, uh, leaving this individual with uh, despondency and depression and anxiety. And I just felt God say that he wants to close that hole at the bottom for you, wants to fill it uh, with Jesus, and then when you fill the bowl up with good things, then they won't all drop out. Uh, I also had the word diabetes. I felt there was someone with uh, a new diagnosis of diabetes, and you feel this has become a ball and chain around your neck. Uh, but I just felt God say, no, it's it's not a ball and chain. Um, I'm going to refine you during this season. I'm going to, just like someone who has to watch their diet and watch what they do a little bit more with diabetes, uh, this is going to be a season uh, that he's going to refine you uh, and the diabetes won't be a ball and chain. Uh, I also saw a very smooth pond, smooth lake, and a lot of mist over it, so there was nothing very clear on the edges at all. And I felt God say there's someone who, who feels their, their mental, their mental faculties have sort of deteriorated um, and getting worse and they can't see clearly, they can't understand things clearly. And then I saw sort of the mist separate a little bit and the trees become visible around the edges. And I felt God say, uh, I'm going to heal you of some of these loss of memories and loss of uh, intellectual capacity. Uh, and then the word skin cancer came um, and also there was someone with skin cancer in an odd place, not where you would normally find skin cancer, as well as there being a lymph node that was inflamed uh, and God wants to heal you of that. Uh, so Father, I just pray for all these individuals that uh, these sort of pictures, images belong to Father, just heal them, um, heal them by your powerful spirit and by your powerful word. Lord, you, your word says that you know us, um, you create us in our mother's womb, Lord. And Father, I just pray uh, that you will bring healing to these people. Come
We love it when you move, God. You're Rafa, our healer. You're Elohim, the God who sees. You are my banner. You are our banner, Jehovah Nisi. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. It's by your precious blood of Jesus that we are saved and we're healed.
we've just been singing about Jesus' blood speaks a better word. And we're now going to spend some time breaking bread, remembering what Jesus did on the cross for us. And so we're going to give you a couple of minutes to go and get some bread and wine. We're going to remember Jesus' body broken for us. We're going to remember that God punished his son instead of us. We're going to remember that Jesus' blood was shed for us. Without the shedding of blood, the Bible says, there's no forgiveness of sin. And our sins have been forgiven because of what Christ did on the cross. I'm going to read some verses from Isaiah chapter 53. I want you to listen to them and let them sink into your hearts and your spirits this morning. Who has believed our message? To whom will the Lord reveal his saving power? My servant grew up in the Lord's presence like a tender shoot sprouting from dry ground and sterile ground. There was nothing beautiful or majestic about his appearance, nothing to attract us to him. He, Jesus, was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows, acquainted with bitterest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way when he went by. He was despised and we did not care. Yet it was our weaknesses he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were punishment from God for his own sins. But he was wound, wounded and crushed for our sins. He was beaten that we might have peace. He was whipped and we were healed. All of us have strayed away like sheep. We have left God's paths to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the guilt and sins of us all. We're going to take this bread and we're going to remember Jesus' body broken for us. We're going to take this wine and drink it, knowing that our sins are forgiven.
Heavenly Father, we come to you as your people, loved by you. We thank you that you sent your son Jesus to die for us in our place. We thank you that because his body was broken, we can be forgiven. Thank you that our sins are washed away because his blood was shed. We are so grateful, Father, for your great love demonstrated in the fact that you gave your son for us. We thank you that he bore our sorrows and our pain and by his stripes we are healed. And Father, I want to pray for each and every one of us watching today. I pray that you would come by your spirit and touch our hearts afresh, that we would know the wonder of Christ and all that he has accomplished for us and all that means for us in these days. We love you. You're an amazing God. You're our Father. We worship you. Amen. It's my great joy and privilege this morning to introduce to you Guy and Heather Miller. Guy uh, leads Commission, the family of churches that Hope Church is part of. He's a good friend. I've known Guy and Heather for many years and uh, it's my pleasure to introduce them and welcome them amongst us today. Well, it's really great to be with you, Hope Online, uh, and to be sharing God's Word with you this Sunday. We really love this church. Obviously, we are heavily invested in it. Uh, love Steve and Annie. Actually, we can trace history going back through John and Marion, back to Greg and Ruth days when we ourselves were young people here at this church and uh, taken on by Greg. Uh, saw some amazing uh miracles in terms of buildings, in terms of salvations, so many leaders raised up. This is an amazing church. We are so grateful to God for all his mercies and really excited, even coming out of this terrible pandemic, excited about what God is going to do with you. Yeah. Every one of you listening to this today, we really are in faith that God's going to meet with you. And it's a great privilege to uh, speak and both of us are going to speak. And uh, the topic we've been asked to speak on, I know you're in a series uh, uh, in terms of a spirit-filled church. The question is, does God heal today? And I want to say both in terms of theologically and also pragmatically and practically, yes. And it'd be quite nice to finish there. <laughs> but uh, I'm not sure the elders will be too happy uh, with that. So... I know people listening to this will have been prayed for and some of you may have been healed. I know many of you listening to this may have been prayed for and you may not have been healed. And I also know, having been a church leader for over 20 years, that there are those who wander around church and can make us feel very, very uncomfortable saying, I want to pray for you. And if we're not healed, what do we what do we do? And so it's a really really important subject, a deep subject, and one which we want to pr perhaps provoke more questions than give just definitive answers. And maybe to start off with my own story uh, and weaving the story in, because it all happened out of Winchester in 1994 when the move of the Spirit was on, when God, through a prophetic word, encouraged me to go to Africa and uh, went to Africa in the middle of a cholera epidemic, came back from Africa very, very seriously ill for over a year, lost lots of weight, uh, had lots and lots of visits to the hospital. And at the end of it, there was a whole ton of medication and uh, a diagnosis as well as having celiac disease. Well, people prayed and elders prayed, hands laid on me, church called to prayer and fasting, and there was no, no, no change. And then quite a few years later in a prayer and fasting at, um, New, in New Frontiers, there was a real sense of God in the place to bring healing. I remember Simon Walker uh, went back from a dairy allergy and his whole family were healed from dairy allergies. And we came back, I came back and uh, ate wheat for the first time in many years and had no side effects. Um, it's usually painful and tummy problems with it. Uh, so I had a year where I just binged 
every McDonald's, uh, Belgian buns, anything I could eat that were <laughs> pasties. I went wheat crazy uh, and had a great time. Um, but a year or so later, I was invited on another mission ship and again got ill. And when I came back, had a number of other tests. And one of the tests said that my celiacs had come back. And since that time, I've been prayed for hundreds of times and have not been healed. And yet, in it all, have found God saying to me, my grace is made perfect in your weakness. And ironically, when I was doing a mission in India just a few years ago, a man who I've never met, um, a man called Shadu, who's a prophetic guy in India, very well known, phoned me up in my hotel and through a translator brought a prophetic word. But he began the prophetic word saying, God wants you to know he knows all about your stomach condition. And he says this to you, my grace is made perfect in your weakness. So I've known both healing. I've known what it is to just have a daily struggle uh, with health and it's out of that context I want to speak to you or we both want to speak to you this morning. One thing we can be absolutely definite about is that Jesus heals. He is a great, wonderful saviour, a good God and loves to do good to his followers. And so I want us to try and help you to both raise your faith, raise your game in the area of healing, but also to do that in a place of peace and security that we serve a good, good father who knows exactly what we need. And so Heather's going to share God's word with, with, with us. We're going to look at a passage in Mark chapter two, and I'm going to challenge us to look at four steps for breakthrough in the area of healing. Thank you. Okay, we're going to read in Mark chapter 2, verses 1 to 12, a familiar story, I'm sure. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. So many gathered, there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Some men came bringing to him a paralytic, carried by four of them. And since they couldn't get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus, and after digging through it, lowered the mat the paralysed man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, Why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take up your mat and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. He got up, took his mat and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, We've never seen anything like this. The first step that we wanted to give you this morning, the breakthrough step, was the need to push through the crowd in verses 2 to 4. It has to start with finding Jesus. In this story, we can see that life isn't all straightforward, sometimes it's messy. The men who carried this paralytic were probably sweaty and hot and sticky. Goodness knows how far they'd walked with him. He was heavy. They got there exhausted. And when they got there, they found that the goal that they wanted, they couldn't even reach because the crowds were so, so big. So instead, they clambered up onto the roof and started getting even dirtier and sweatier, pulling off tiles, dropping bits onto the crowd below, all in an effort to see this man reach Jesus. Then they lowered him, probably a bit wobbly, a bit precarious, down to the feet of Jesus. And uh, he was suddenly the center, of the, the center of attention, the embarrassment of that. And I think one of the challenges of COVID has been this whole thing that life, as we know it, has become very messy. Mm. We're used to everything being normal, neat, tidy. Even Jesus, we fit him, fit him into maybe first thing in the morning or last thing at night. Mm. He becomes part of a neat routine, but suddenly all our routines are out the window. We're working from home. We've got kids. We're being furloughed. We've got elderly relatives. How can we see them? We're being locked in. Even a straightforward trip to the supermarket, which is normally I'm just nipping to the shops, you pop in, you think, I don't know where the food is. Is there going to be anything for me to buy? Everything's in a mess. And it's at times like this how important it is 
that we find Jesus, that we struggle through the crowds, as it were, the crowds of our mind very often to find Jesus and to be still before him. The pushing through the crowds obviously was so important for the paralytic because in doing that, he met with Jesus, he had his sins forgiven and he was healed. And in a very real way, our life is transformed in this frazzled time when we push through to meet with Jesus. Suddenly prayer is not, I should be praying more. It's kind of, I have to pray more to survive, to, to feel God's presence, to know his help on a day-to-day -day basis. I need to pray more. There's a new desperation. We must find him or we'll perish. And he's never more present than one life is a struggle. And he says to each one of us at this time, don't fear for I am with you. So that's the first breakthrough step, pushing through the crowds. The second we would suggest is breaking man-made structures. And this particular miracle did not play, take place in a temple. It took place in somebody's home. And it's interesting that in this present crisis that many of our man-made structures, our beautiful buildings that we've mm. worked so hard to get have suddenly become obsolete, hardly yeah. anybody in them. We can't invite people to church. We can't go to church ourselves. So how important it is that we bring church to the people. And I think many people would say that suddenly the community that was so close and so special in church has now become a wider community. We're reaching out to neighborhoods and friends and people over the, over the fence. Even in London's busy, inhospitable blocks of flats where nobody knows anybody, suddenly things have started to change. People are pushing notes through letterboxes. Mm. They're dropping off food parcels. They're talking and asking, how are you? Are you coping? We're helping each other. We're becoming a community. That has changed and it's a good thing. Mm. One of the things that Guy and I have been so excited about coming back to Bournemouth, we've been in Bournemouth since the beginning of lockdown, was an incredible opportunity that we've had. There's been years of building relationships with our neighbours, which have got a bit lost along the way living in London as we have been. But recently we've had three street services. Hmm. The first one was Easter, the second one was Pentecost, and the third was just last Sunday uh, where we celebrated together the wonderful NHS. And uh, we met 30 or 40 of us socially distanced out on our streets. We had PA. And we had a service. We all sang Amazing Grace together. We all listened to somebody explain how that, story, that, that hymn came into being. We had the Lord's Prayer. Mm -hmm. We prayed together. And then afterwards, it's an amazing opportunity to go and chat to our neighbours and mm -hmm. had some incredible conversations and opportunities as a result. And this is all as we've got out of our church building and we've got out on the streets. And the final little story I want to tell you about in terms of that is... This whole thing about healing, it's, it's much easier to pray for healing when you're in a church, mm. but get out on the streets. And we had an opportunity probably six months or so ago now, where a lady that we met at the market who we buy our fruit and veg off every week. Uh, and we have, I don't have, he has a common interest in fishing. So we've got to know her quite well. Yeah. Well, one day she told us with tears in her eyes that she'd been to the hospital. She was a smoker and she discovered that well, they discovered a, a lump on her lung and she was obviously very frightened about it. That was a nice, quiet sun Saturday morning. <laughs> so we thought, looked at each other, got to do it. Let's offer to pray. It was a very quick, very simple prayer. She was a bit self-conscious. We were a bit self-conscious, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, two weeks later, she came running to us and said, I went back to the hospital. My lump has gone. I've been healed. Yeah. What a wonderful opportunity. Um, I'd love to say that she knows now that her sins have forgiven her, but I'm not sure she does know that yet. But it's all part of a process. It's all part of getting out of our closed walls, out of our man-made structures and out onto the streets. And uh, I'll just finish with a quote from John Wimber who says, you can't learn how to heal the sick in a book or mastering a technique. You believe what Jesus promised and then you get out and do it. Very good. Very good. So the third area I want to talk about is breakthrough in terms of religion. Getting through man-made structures is one thing, but here in this story, there is this toxic atmosphere. The teachers of the law, they were sitting thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? Religion 
holds back the work of grace and the work of God, in particular in terms of signs, wonders and the gospel advance. And uh, these guys were the they were the top brass of the day. The Pharisees teach the law. They were the people who were in between the average person and God. They spoke on God's behalf. They knew how God acted. They had a very, very strict discipline. They, they, would, they had the us and them. There was the sort of Gentiles, there was the pigs, the dogs, and there were the righteous ones. They were the leaders of the righteous ones. And they would explain the actions of God through his word and through history. And Jesus didn't fit their category. He didn't, he didn't fit into the way in which God should act or speak or behave. And Jesus is in a room and he's addressing this. And you've got to imagine the atmosphere being very, very tense. And that tension being broken as the tiles and the dust start to fall. Uh, people are wiping dust off their heads lifting a bit of plaster off their brow and uh, here comes a human spider being lowered, curled up on a mat and dropped in front of them. And they are, you, you almost feel like <sighs> and sucking like on a lemon to see this is really not the proper way to behave even in front of a rabbi. And uh, they were li listening to what Jesus was going to say and all this was going on in their minds. And uh, Jesus said, he knew what they were thinking and said, only God can do what, God, what I'm now going to do. Only God can cause a paralytic to rise up and only God can forgive sins. See, they knew their Bibles. They knew that when Jesus says what is easier, they knew that anyone who said your sins are forgiven you was claiming to be God. And for that, for them, this was, a, this was absolutely awf an awful thing. They could see nothing good in what was just about to happen. Religion, we live in a religious world. Religion is all about looking good. It's all about our robes, our behaviour, our buildings, our impressive words that we say, uh, particularly when it comes to law. We, we like to give laws to people. We like to say this is the way we behave. We all have to dress in a, in a certain way or act in a certain manner. We can't go to certain places. And religion is like bad breath. It stinks. Everyone else knows it stinks, but the person who is religious. And Jesus is getting right into the, the, the nitty gritty of why God is often kept at arm's length and why God can do no mighty works in the midst of people who are saying, where is God? Because of unbelief, because of a religious spirit that tends to dominate. And we must be very careful not to point the finger and think, well, yes, that group of Christians wouldn't see healing or, or those, that other faith is, is, is a mile away from God, when actually God would challenge us that we can be very religious ourselves. We can have a religious spirit when it comes to thinking of healing. We can think of a number of ways in which we think God should behave in order to bring healing. And what we wanted to encourage you today is to think about, actually, you can't put Jesus in a box. Jesus is God. He can do whatever, whenever he likes. And we must be very, very careful to watch out for a religious spirit that puts Jesus at arm's length from the need that is around us. So three ways in which this might happen. Let me suggest one. We might think, oh, they're sick. Leave it to the elders. Or leave it to the ministry team, leave it to the professionals, let, let the people who've got some skills, people who've gone to LL Grange, don't they know what they're doing? Hand it over to them. They're going to sort it all out. I'm, I'm off the hook. Whew. This person is sharing with me. They're not feeling well. No. Now, of course, we believe the Bible. We, of course, the elders in James 5, 4, if any of you are sick, let them call the elders. There is a stepping up of faith. I just want to challenge the elders here at Hope Church. We should be right on the front foot. Wherever there's sickness, we should be praying for the sick because we're instructed and encouraged to do it. Have jars of oil at the front of our meetings, praying regularly for those that are sick. But we must not, every one of us, think, therefore, this isn't for us. Jesus, in his commissioning of his disciples, talks about going out into the highways and byways and bringing the kingdom of God. And part of that is lay hands on the sick and they will get well.
Mm. A bit like that story Heather told, just laying hands, praying in the name of Jesus. And we were as amazed as she was that she got healed. Secondly, the way in which religious spirits can work is some of us try and do something that only God can do. We want a label. We want to put a label on ourselves that I'm a healer. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm someone who moves in the supernatural. I, I, I can do this because I've been trained. I can do this because I'm on a hotline to heaven. I, I'm closer to God than everybody else. I, I'm more anointed, more gifted, more called than anybody else. And you sometimes meet people who come into church for the very first time and, and they slap a label on themselves. I'm a healer. I think we need to walk with humility with healing. It's only God who heals. Mm. We're encouraged to pray for the sick, every one of us to pray for the sick, but it's God who heals. And we are just connecting like a little link. We're just a little link in the connection from the divine arm of omnipotence and the need on planet Earth. And the thirdly, third thing, Heather's mentioned it already in terms of religion, we can like to play on our home turf. If you're a football player, you'll understand what that means. We like all the games to be at home. Actually, if we're to see the kingdom of God expanding, many more people being saved, many more miracles, we must take this mm. to our neighbours, to our friends, to the highways and byways and streets, because there's a world that's suffering. Mm. And most of the miracles recorded in Jesus' ministry and in the Acts occurred outside of the four walls of buildings. Mm. So let me encourage you to up your game. We want to up our game as well. Maybe once a month, encourage each other. When you hear a person who says, I'm unwell, when you hear of a story of a sickness or a cancer, be on the front foot to say, hey, do you mind if I pray? I'd love just to pray for that in the name of Jesus. The final breakthrough, and that is we need to have breakthrough faith. It says Verse four, since they could not, this is the friend, since they could not get to him, that's Jesus, because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof. And when Jesus saw their faith, faith, faith pleases God. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Hebrews 11. Peter talks about faith of greater worth than gold. Healing is not a formula. Healing is not a trick. Healing is not superficial. Healing is about faith, mm. about connecting our lives, our prayers to Almighty God and asking his kingdom to come. And faith operates in this story in a number of ways, in a number of people. But it begins with people who are willing to bring their friends to Jesus. And what is interesting in this story, and I really want to underline this, is faith begins in trusting in Jesus Christ. See, Jesus didn't say to this paralytic, hey, great to see you, well done, son, get up and walk. No, what this paralytic most needed to hear was, son, your sins are forgiven you. Can you imagine being that paralytic? <laughs> hang, on, hang on, Jesus, <laughs> I think you might miss the game. I'm a paralytic, can't move. Uh, my friends have brought me that I might be healed and you're talking about sins? <laughs> you're not in with the story and then as he looks into the eyes of omnipotence as he looks into the eyes of a god who can do everything the one who spoke creation into being the one who loves this world so much as he looked into the eyes of divine love he suddenly saw his greatest need to get up and walk and walk back into a sin-filled life a world where he plunged himself back into the cesspit of sin was not what god was asking him not what jesus was asking he needed to see his greatest need. If you're listening to this today and uh, you're a mile from Jesus, you're far off from Jesus, your greatest need is to have your sins forgiven. Mm -hmm. The Bible describes you as dead in, in your trespasses and sins, dead to the voice of God, dead to everything that God wants to do in your life. And Jesus has paid the price for you and me to become children of God. He's died upon a cross. He's borne the punishment our sin deserves upon that cross 2,000 years ago. And God and heaven declared Jesus righteous, not guilty. He carried our sin and bore our punishment and heaven and the Holy Spirit resurrected Jesus from the dead, declaring that there is new life for all who would trust in him, all who would believe in him. And 
all of faith begins at that point. This is the greatest miracle on earth when you put your faith in Jesus Christ. Can I encourage you this morning just to do that in the quietness of your home or bedroom, wherever you are this morning? It's a prayer away just to ask Jesus to come and save you. But from that point, I'm going to finish with this. Jesus then turns to the paralytic and to the crowd and said this, so that you may know the Son of Man has authority to forgive sins, I say to you, get up and walk. Healing came to that man. Faith began with his friends. Faith operates in Jesus. Faith then operates in the paralytic. Faith then operates in the crowds. They're all amazed. Wow, this is a this is a miracle. Let's bring our sick because Jesus can do this. It's infectious, faith infectious, but it takes a person, one person, to begin that process. That's the way faith operates. And so let me draw these four threads together in five practical applications for every one of us, because I like practice. It's good to hear teaching and theology, but what is, what, what's God asking us to do? Firstly, we need more signs. If you ever try to get to Wardour Castle, Robin Hood's Castle, just by Shaftesbury, you'll drive any of the roads into Shaftesbury, you'll see a big sign. Turn down one of those roads, you never see another sign. <laughs> Spend forever driving around around these little roads, crossroads, sections, no, and then when you do finally see the castle, there's a sign. It's like, well, thanks a lot. I needed that sign a bit. Can I say to you, Hope Church, put up many more signs that Jesus is alive. Put the signs up, not in this building, because no one's going to come into the building to see a sign, particularly in COVID-19. Put up signs all over Winchester, all over Chandler's Ford, Allsford, Kingsworthy. Put them all up. Jesus is alive. How do they see that sign? By you praying for the sick. Mm. Secondly, don't worship a sign. No one stops at a sign and goes, hallelujah, I'm at Wardour Castle. No, they, they know it's a pointing to something greater. In some ways, you could think of healings and signs and wonders like beautiful wrapping paper that's around the gift, the greatest gift of the gospel. You see children who rip away wrapping paper and then play with wrapping paper as if this is the present. I've seen charismatic Christians playing with healing and miracles as if, oh, this is what it's all about. No, Jesus is what it's all about. The gospel is what it's all about. But every beautiful sign is there to point people to Christ. It's caused all of us to wonder what heaven's going to be like when that day of sickness being ended, death being ended, sin being ended, and we're fully whole, fully made whole in the presence of God with a brand new body. Thirdly, healing is about grace. It's all about grace. There are no strings attached. We've pray, I've prayed for many people in the open air. Many people have been healed. Not many of them have come back and thanked Jesus. There are no strings attached. We, we offer, we're moved by the compassion of Jesus to pray for those who are hurting. And, and I believe many will be healed. Many will, whether that's mentally or whether that's physically, they'll be healed. And they'll come into a place of grace. And we can rejoice in it, but we can't, go and say, well, unless you come to church, we're not going to pray for you. We offer, we freely receive, we freely give. And to anybody who's into scalp counting, how many people have you seen healed? Can I just say, it's not about us, it's about him. Mm. It's about bringing people to Jesus. Our confidence is in Jesus, not in ourselves. And it's very dangerous when we start to attribute to ourselves as if we are the arbiter of God's power. We are mere vessels in his hands. And finally, as you know, fourthly, rather, healing is not a formula or a status symbol. I've met Christians who say, if you do this, if you do this, if you speak in tongues, if you go pray, pray and fasting for a month, if you do this and speak in this certain way, if you command in a certain voice, if you, if you can do the supernatural if you follow these simple rules. It's not a formula. I've heard one of the most powerful healing evangelists in, in, in the world today talk at a conference last year, and he said the best he's ever found in praying for the sick is 20% are healed. That means 80% aren't healed. 
And so we need to have soft hearts in dealing with people when we pray for them, compassion with people, not to stop us praying for the sick, but an understanding that there is a mystery in healing mm. and we are not the arbiters of why God does or doesn't. We are just obedient, obedient servants to pray. And then finally, and this is very important, we must in our culture deal with cynicism. Cynicism is unbelief. We don't like to call it unbelief, but it is unbelief. It robs us and it robs others of God opportunities, God moments. Jesus could do no mighty miracles in his hometown. Why not? Because, well, we know Jesus. We know how he fell off the tree and scraped his knee and they would not receive Jesus as the saviour, as the king. And unbelief is faith in the wrong reality. Think of Peter walking on the water. He had a greater faith in gravity than he did in Jesus. We're encouraged to put our faith in Christ, not to look around and wonder what others are saying, not to look at the culture of unbelief and cynicism we're living in, but to look to Jesus and say, Jesus, I want to be your hands and your feet in this dark world today. And I want to do the things that you asked me to do. And one of those things Jesus asked us to do is to lay hands on the sick, knowing that they will get well. We put Jesus into that place where he can move and operate. So... Drawing this into two practical applications as I finish today, I want to just pray for you listening on this screen. Stretch out your hands right where you are. Look into this screen and I'm going to pray in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Be healed today. Sicknesses go in the name of Jesus where the enemy has come in and there's mental challenges in the mind, depressions and anxieties and fears. I pray in the name of Jesus that you set people free and where there's illness today, where there is pain today, in the name of Jesus, we say go. Mm. And may there be healing in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. And secondly, I want you to be on the front foot and go out like we have nervously out onto our streets and to tell others and to be Christ to others, whether that's doing little love acts in terms of dropping notes through just be on the front foot, brothers and sisters, here in hope, to look to God for miracles. Mm. Look to your neighbour where they're in need and to look to pray. And you'll be amazed how many signs, if we all do this, how many signs are pointing to Christ and how many more people will come to him in the future. We love you. Wish we could be with you face to face. But God bless you as you put this word into practice. Amen. Amen.